So quantified modal logic is important because first we had both propositional and predicate logic, and it was clear that there were reasons for enhancing our resources in order to accommodate some arguments that work um, that we couldn't represent in propositional logic alone. So the basic idea was we were trying to um, we were trying to use enhanced devices for representing the structure inside of a proposition rather than just a simple name for the entire proposition itself. So all whales or mammals came out as just the letter P or some other letter in propositional logic. But in predicate logic, we got to represent a little more conceptual structure in the proposition to include reference to the predicates being a whale and being a mammal. We're going to do the same thing here, in part because some arguments, at least in philosophy, but maybe elsewhere outside of philosophy and science in general, for example, there's talk of essential properties versus non-essential or contingent properties. So sometimes people say, Aristotle is reported to have said that humans are essentially rational. Uh, whether that's true or not, isn't the issue. If we want to report what he said, we're gonna to have to have some devices beyond simple predicate logic. Other times people say there are properties that all human beings have, but they aren't essential. Um, Aristotle has another example, being a featherless biped. Um, human beings are all featherless bipeds, we might suppose. Uh, but they're not essentially featherless bipeds. So we get a distinction between necessary and contingent properties, and then there are possible properties as well as actual properties. So you have a certain color of eyes. So do I. Um, could you have had a different color of eyes? Could you have been taller than you are? If so, if there's any possible ways that you might have been different than you actually are, then you have possible properties that aren't actual properties. So if we're going to represent that in our logic, we have to have a way of talking about the properties themselves and the predicates that express those properties being contingent or being necessary. In addition, there are sentences that are necessary or contingent. And sometimes we want to peer inside the content of the sentence or proposition that is necessary or not necessary. Using just modal propositional logic, all we can say is the sentence P has a box in front of it, but we don't know what's inside of P. So for example, you want to be able to say bachelors are unmarried is a necessary truth. Maybe you want to represent that in a way that reveals that the predicate is a bachelor, is in the proposition, and is not married, is in the proposition. So if we're going to do both of those, we will need to have modal operators operating on predicate formulas beyond simple propositional formulas. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to learn how to do proofs and how to do counter models for formulas that have predicate structure as well as modal operators. Now, this part of the course is not tremendously complicated because the hard part of any logic is learning how the connectives work. That's what propositional logic is about. When we get to modal logic, there's both the connectives, but there's also the modal operators. So we have to learn rules for those in addition to the rules we already learned for the connectives. The rules for doing proofs in predicate logic are no different than what we've already encountered. We needed intro and limb rules. We've already got quantifier rules and all the rules of predicate logic. So we have all the resources we need for doing proofs. The crucial thing is when we turn to the semantics and the counter models, we need to know what the semantics look like. And I am going to share my screen now with the notes and talk through the slides. As you can see, for our discussion of quantified modal logic, we're going to spend most of our time talking about the philosophical issues and their significance. 
And the only thing we need to focus on initially are two versions of the semantics for the system and the counter models. Now it turns out there's basically only one important question about the semantics and it has to do with the domains for the worlds that we're talking about. An intuitive thought, one that is due to Ruth, Mark and Marcus in the 1950s before Kripke is that every world has the same domain. And that makes certain formulas provable that wouldn't be provable otherwise. We will call that a fixed domain semantics for the system. The other semantics for the system is the variable domain semantics. The simpler version is fixed domain, but it's also not the most intuitive semantics. If you think about what worlds might be like, how might the world have been different than it actually is? Well, it might have had different people in it. You're in this world, but you might not have been in some other world. So it looks like we should prefer a semantics that allows the domain for each world to vary. So we will first look at the simple version and then at the variable domain version later on. So a fixed domain model is an ordered quadruple. So you've got a set of worlds, that's the big W. You've got a relation of accessibility on the worlds. You've got a domain. And that domain is the same for every world. It is a set of objects. And then you have the interpretation function, which does what the interpretation function did in uh, predicate logic, except this time relative to worlds. So we have a non-empty set of worlds, an accessibility relation, a non-empty domain, and an interpretation function. The interpretation function assigns to each constant some element in the domain, and to each n place predicate a set of n plus one tuples where the first n members are elements of the domain, and the last member is some world or other. So we have an n plus one tuple consisting of the usual n place tuples that we learned about in predicate logic. And then we just add a world to say which worlds that predicate is satisfied by sequences of objects. The idea then is that the interpretation function assigns n tuples to n place predicates, but relativized to a given world, which is accomplished by including the world in the tuple. The valuation function V then generates truth values for formulas as expected from our earlier study of such a function for predicate logic and modal propositional logic. What does a variable domain semantics do in addition? Remember we said the key element is you want to allow there to be different objects in different worlds. To accomplish this, we have both a domain which we will now call a superdomain, and then we'll have a subset of that domain for each world. So we will have a five place quintuple consisting of a non empty set of worlds, an accessibility relation on worlds, a non empty superdomain, that's the big D this time, a function that assigns to each world a subset of the superdomain, that's the scripted letter F there and an interpretation function as well. So both of the last two items are functions. D is a set of objects. Big F is a function from the domain to a subset of the domain for each world. And I is the usual interpretation function. The additional function from the domain to the subset of it for each world yields a semantics that functions just like a positive semantics for free logic so that the domain includes everything that exists at any world and the new function picks out the items in the superdomain that exist at each world. We will refer to the subdomain for a given world W as the domain subscripted to the world. That's what we will end up with when the function F is applied to the domain relative to a world. The valuation function then behaves as expected, assigning truth values for a world using D sub W rather than the big D, thereby relativizing, tr relativizing truth to a given world and its particular domain. 
once we have this in place, we can look at formulas and do proofs or counter models, depending on whether we have something that is valid or invalid. So here are four that we will practice on. And what I'm going to do is draw up a screen sharing program and um, try to draw out each of these. So if you look at these, here's what I hope you can see. Just by inspection, it looks to me that number one should turn out to be invalid. So we're going to try to do a counter model for it. Number two looks to me like it's going to be valid. It says a conjunction is possible. So you're going to have to have a world that realizes that possibility. And in that world, FA will be true and GA will be true. And so long as the accessibility relation is reflexive, once you get FA in a world, you're going to get diamond FA in a world. And once you get GA in a world, you're going to get diamond GA in a world. So number two looks to me like we shouldn't try to construct a counter model to it. Instead, we will try to give a proof of it. Number three looks to me to be a problem designed for a variable domain semantics. Um, if you had every object being the same across all worlds, it looks to me like you won't be able to get a counter model to this. But suppose you let the actual world be the world that realizes the possibility that is the premise. Well, then in that world, you've got A existing. And so you're going to have to have box FA or box some sort of F. You're going to have to have box FA because the X that you pick is something that's identical to A. So whatever it is, it's going to have to be at least A. You might have other things that are identical to A, but at least you'll have A is identical to A in that world. And you'll have box FA. But suppose you pick a different world to realize this possibility. So you assume that the actual world isn't one that realizes this possibility, but you're going to look at a different world to realize the possibility. That leaves open putting not FA in the actual world. In some other world, you'll have to have box FA, but you won't have to have it in the actual world. So it looks to me if we um, resort to variable domain semantics, we should be able to get a counter model to number three and the same for number four. Number four is a special problem that uh, works for variable domain semantics. And it has to do with um, some formulas that Ruth Bark and Marcus proved for um, simple domain, constant domain semantics, uh, but fail for variable domain semantics. So let's first look at the first one. OK, now our first problem is has as premises diamond FA and diamond GA. So let's make a world where we put those two things in it. So we have diamond FA in the world and diamond GA. Now, the conclusion says the conjunction of FA and GA is possible. And we're going to claim that that's not true. So we're going to put, after doing box operator exchange, we're going to put that it's necessary that not FA and GA. Now, given that all of our worlds are going to be at least accessible to each other, we get reflexivity, accessible to themselves, not to each other, which means we're going to have not FA or not GA. in this world. 
All right, now we have to have worlds that realize each of these two possibilities. So let's just arbitrarily pick one for this world. So I'm gonna say FA realizes this possibility, the top one, and I'm gonna mark it as an arbitrary assignment so that we don't get confused if this blows up on us. Okay, now we need a different world and notice we can't use the same world because once you get FA and not FA or not GA, you can deduce from those two things that this world is not the world that realizes the second possibility, the possibility of GA. So let's make another world. And we make this world explicitly for realizing the possibility of GA. And we'll also make this rule, this world accessible to itself. So we have GA in this world. Now, since the second world is accessible from the first, whatever is boxed will show up over here as well. So we end up with not FA or not GA in this world, which forces us to have not FA in this world. Okay, now that completes our counter models because we have two atomic formulas, GA and FA. Both worlds we have filled in far enough so that we've assigned truth values to each of them. And now notice that our conclusion is false. Our conclusion says there is a world that has both FA and GA in it, but there are only two worlds. FA and GA is not here. FA and GA is not here, so the conclusion is false on this model. So that's a counter model to the first problem. Now the second problem I said we're gonna to try to do a proof of but let's hold off on that. The third problem I have to draw a lot, so let's do the fourth problem first because at least that's a little bit easier to draw. The problem isn't very hard, it's just all the symbols. So let's put the premise in our initial world. It's necessary that something is F. Once we put that in, of course, we have to have something to be F. So let's just pick A to be F. And that was arbitrary. All right, now we also need the conclusion to be false. So we need it to be false that there is something that is box F. So that means everything everything will fail to be box F. And so in particular, A will have that property. All right. Now, the negation of a box is, of course, a diamond, not FA. So we have to have some world to realize that possibility. It can't be the actual world because we've already got FA in that world. So let's put not FA in this world. All right, now that's fine. This world is accessible to itself. That's fine except for one complication because we have for all X not box FX. And we also have box EX FX. So in this world, 
we have to have this, and we don't yet have that. That formula is not made true by anything at this point. And pretty obviously, we can't use A to make it true. So we're going to have to use something else. It doesn't matter what you pick. Just pick something else. So let's use B. We're going to put B in this world. We're not going to put B in our first world, only in our second world. And now we have assigned truth values to everything for each of the worlds. We have that EXFX is true in every world. So box EXFX is true. But it's not true that there's something that is necessarily F. For something to be box F would require that there be a thing that is F in every world that it exists. And that thing would have to exist in this world. So what you might notice is there's nothing in this world. The only thing we know about this first world is that A exists in it. That's the only object in the domain for that world. Now you might notice that FB exists only in this world. So FB is true in every world accessible to this world. And so you might notice that box FB is true in this world. That's correct. And so you would notice that EX box FX is true in this world, the second world. But that's OK, because the proof is about what exists in our initial world. What's true in our initial world is that box EFXFX is true. And what is true in our first world is that nothing is, nothing is box F. That's just a remark about the first world. The fact that something is box F in the second world doesn't affect the first world at all. Okay, so that's the fourth one. Here's the third one. This is the one where we have to draw long formulas. So I'm going to skip drawing out the whole diamond. And we're just going to use, that's our premise. And we're going to use the actual world to be the world that realizes this possibility. So the actual world will be a world where there is something that's identical to A. And that thing is box F X. All right. Now, that's an arbitrary assumption on my part. And as soon as I make it, I start to worry. Here's why. This is a conjunction. So since there's something identical to A, you're going to have to have A in this world. So let's put A equals A. That's a theorem anyway. So yeah, there is something that is identical to A. But then notice what I have to say. I have to say box F A and of course, if I get box FA, I have to get FA, but that's exactly what I was trying to show that I don't have. That's the conclusion of this argument. And so what I really wanted was start with the possibility claim and also the denial of the conclusion. And I wanted to give a counter model on which that first formula and this formula didn't lead to problems. But if I use the actual world to realize the possibility in the first premise, things blow up on me. So I can't do this. I can't use this world. 
So I still want to do these other two things. I want the I want the possibility premise to be true in this world. And I want the denial of the conclusion to be true in this world. All right, so let's not use the actual world, the initial world as the world to realize that possibility. Let's instead make a different world to realize it. So in this world, we have something that's identical with A. And that thing is box F. All right, so we can make that be true in the same way we did in the initial world. Let's let A be identical to A and let's make A be box F. And so we have A is F in this world. And this world is a world that can see itself. So given that this is the only world that can see itself, if we put F A in here, that will guarantee that box F A is true as well, because this world can only see itself. All right, now what, what's left to be done? The answer is nothing. We put that A isn't F in this world. It is F in our second world. Since the second world is accessible from the first world, that means box F A is not true in this world. Neither is box not F A, because we have one world with each of the two, two truth values. And those are the only atomic formulas in either world that we need to pay attention to. So just by making a second world to realize the possibility in the first world, we can show that FA doesn't follow from the fact that it's possible that something is identical to A and it is box F. Now notice that you have to have a variable domain semantics for this to work. We don't have, actually, I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. Let me take that back. Forget I said that. Now you might be thinking, well, we have A equals A in the actual world. This thought just occurred to me and you may wonder, doesn't that make things bad? Because now box A equals A is true since a equals A is in this world and it's in this world. So box A equals A is gonna be true over here. All of that is correct, but it doesn't cause any special problems. So there's our counter model to the third one. That leaves us with just the proof for the second one. So I'm not gonna draw out all the steps for the second one, but I just wanna sketch what looks to me like a proof that will work. We may have actually proven something like this already. If you just replace FA and GA with propositional variables, I think we proved that um, possibility distributes over conjunctions. But in case you didn't do that proof or don't remember how it works, just do this. Make an assumption for purposes of doing um, diamond elimination. That will allow you to put FA on the line together with GA, and that's an assumption that you're making. So that's an assumption that will have to be discharged. Now, notice from there you can get FA on a line, <clears throat> and then you can discharge this assumption, the assumption at line two that 
allows you to discharge it by adding a diamond to something. So at the next step, you could do diamond F. A, and then you can put GA on the line. This one is justified by diamond. Elimination, discharging line two. Once we get to GA, we can do the same thing. Use this rule once more to justify that line and then put those two lines together to give us the conclusion. And I seem to remember proving that except not with predicates and constants, but rather in the propositional logic that we were learning, studying. And so it's not surprising that it's an easy proof here. Diamonds do distribute across conjunctions, so that's a fairly easy proof. Okay, I am back. That's the uh, technical details of modal logic. I will try to give you some uh, homework problems that you can work on for doing proofs. But the proofs, the hard part about proofs you've already accomplished, it's mastering how modal propositional logic proofs work. This is just a tiny little addition. And so we'll work some on that and we'll work on counter models. So pay attention to the CIDR homework. He spends more time on the counter models and the semantic proofs, but we'll do a few examples of the other. 